So before we begin, let's let's look at at two examples here. So what I'm going to be doing over the the next two examples is we're going to try and link congruence to being elements in a a sub ring. So let's look at congruence in Z mod 3. So we're dealing with the, the integers. Now it's going to be mod 3. My next example is we're going to be dealing with polynomials, uh, mod a, a specific polynomial. And we'll see how these two things are going to be related to, to subrings. All right, so for example 1, we can say in the ring Z, A is congruent to B modulo 3. This means that if we look at the, the difference between A and B, so the distance between these two, it has to be a multiple of 3. So this means A minus B is a multiple of 3. So let's let I be the set of all multiples of 3. Oop. Writing the same thing twice, don't really want to do that. Uh, so be the set of all uh, multiples of 3. So I is going to look as follows. We're looking at all multiples, so 0 is going to be in there. Plus and minus 3 is going to be in there. Plus and minus 6 is going to be in there. And again, so on and so forth. Now I can also rewrite this as the set of 3 times k, where k is just going to be an element of z. So we just created a set i. It is a, a subset of, um, of z, but it just strictly contains all multiples of 3. Well, then we can say that a is congruent to b modulo 3. This is just going to mean that the difference between the two, a minus b, A minus B has to be an element of the set I. Now, not only is it a set, I want to be able to show you that this is in fact a, a subring. So let's let's go through the subring test because we are taking this um, um, we're just taking all the, the multiples of three. So we've taken elements in, in Z, but again, one of making sure that this is sub subring, it has to, to satisfy the, the two properties. Well, um, it has to be non-empty. And clearly it's going to be non-empty, but it also has to be closed under subtraction and under multiplication. So let's do the subring test. So we know 3 times 0. Because 0 is an element of Z. This equals 0. And this is an inside I. So this means that, of course, i is, is not empty. It has the zero element inside of there. Now, what about for subtraction and what about for multiplication? Well, let's say a and b are elements inside of i. And since these are just multiples of 3, I could write this as a is going to be equal to, we'll say, 3m. And b is equal to 3n where m and n are elements of the integers. They're elements of z. So if we look at a minus b, well, this is just equal to a plus a minus b, again, by the, the negative uh, theorems that we have. Now, if I just substitute in, for a, I'm just going to plug in 3m, uh, b, I'm going to plug in 3n. So this is going to give me 3m plus minus 3n, 
which of course we can rewrite as three times m minus n, which is an element of i because m minus n, um, sorry, it's not an element of r, it's an element of z. So we've closed under subtraction. Now let's find out for multiplication. So a times b. Well, this is just 3m times 3n, which is equal to 3 times 3mn, which is an element of i because 3mn is an element of z. So it's non-empty, it's closed under subtraction, and it's closed under multiplication. Thus, it is in fact a subring. So what we're saying here is that we're stating congruence, A is congruence, B modulo 3, is the same as saying the difference between the two, or the distance between A and B, has to be an element of a specific subring. All right, well, let's look at the second example here. So if we're looking at polynomials, let's look at the rationals of joint x modulo uh, x squared minus 2. So same as before, let's suppose we have the polynomial ring q adjoint x and we'll say f and g are elements inside q adjoint x. So f is congruent to g mod um, x squared minus 2. This is true if and only if x squared minus 2 divides f minus g. Has to be, I can take the difference between the two, it has to be a multiple of, of my polynomial, my x squared minus x, or my, sorry, my x squared minus 2. So same as before, let's build a set i. So i is going to be equal to the polynomial, we'll say h of x, times the x squared minus 2, such that h of x is an element of q adjoint x. So what are we doing? We're taking the x squared minus 2, and we're multiplying it by every single element inside of Q adjoint X. And that's giving us that's giving us I. So we want to first verify, same as before. Uh, verify that I is a subring. Of Q adjoint X with the property. And what property is this? Well, we're going to say whenever um, k of x, so a polynomial k, is an element inside of q adjoint x. And we'll say t of x is an element inside of i. Then k of x, t of x is an element of i. So this, again, this is the property that we're going to be verifying. So again, as I stated, k is an element of q adjoint x. 
T is an element of I, and the product of T and anything inside of T or anything inside of Q is going to get us back something that's inside of, of I. Let me actually just write that. It's kind of a, an absorption uh, property. There we go. So just kind of a note. We say whenever whenever you multiply um, an element of I by any element in the ring. Now, as I said, it can either be in I in itself or it can be in the, the original ring, the, the Q adjoint X in this case. So either inside or outside of I. Uh, the resulting uh, the resulting element is an I. So that's what we're kind of talking about, the absorption property. If we take something in I and we multiply it by anything else, we're getting back something that's in, in I. Now, in terms of verifying the, the subring, we've done that already with the last example, so I'll leave that as, uh, as an exercise for, for you folks. So again, what do we end up with here? We get that F is congruent um, what was I using? F and G. So F is congruent to G uh, modulo X squared minus two. What does this mean now in terms of this? This is these two things are equal to one another if or equivalent to one another. If F minus G, the difference between the two is an element of I. All right, so this leads us into our, our definition of exactly what we've been talking about. This is the, the definition of an ideal. So we say a subring I of a ring R is an ideal provided, so we're, we're establishing the fact that I is going to be a, a subring. So non-empty, closed under... Um, closed under addition, sorry, not addition, it's closed under subtraction um, and multiplication inside of R. And it also has this additional property that whenever R is in R and A is in I, again, this absorption property, that uh, R times A is element of I and A times R is an element of, of I. Now, just thing to note, we do have to, in fact, be careful. So I've stated both that if I multiply on, on either side, I'm still going to get something that is inside of, of I. Why? Because, again, we're just talking about arbitrary rings. So the ring, in fact, may not be um, commutative. So as I stated here, the double absorption condition uh, that R times A is an element of I and A times R is an element of I is necessary for non-commutative rings. When R is obviously commutative, this doesn't really matter because R times A is equal to A times R, which again is an element inside of, of I. So it reduces down to, to, to that.